Hey everybody, welcome to the video on circular motion on the bank surface with friction. In a previous video on bank surfaces without friction, we're able to quantitatively derive an expression for an ideal velocity for a vehicle going around a bank surface without needing friction. However, in real life situations, you can imagine the vehicle will not be able to maintain this ideal velocity all the time. If the vehicle's velocity is greater than the ideal velocity it's supposed to have, then we need more centripetal force or greater centripetal force to keep the object in circular motion without changing its radius. When this happens, the static friction between the slope or the bank surface and the tires of the vehicle will act down the slope. This is shown by the blue vector here. By having this static friction vector going down the slope, we'll have a greater centripetal force and we'll have a look at this in a moment. In contrast, if the velocity of the vehicle slows down and becomes slower than the ideal velocity, then we need a smaller centripetal force to keep the object in the same circular motion. So in this case, the static friction will actually act up the slope. So this is to provide a smaller centripetal force and allowing a smaller velocity to be used in the same circular motion of the same radius. Let's start by analyzing the situation where the velocity of the vehicle is greater than the ideal velocity without needing any friction. So in this case, my static friction is acting down the slope. If we resolve the vectors into a vertical component and the horizontal component, the vertical component becomes the static friction times by sine theta, where theta is the angle at which the surface is banked at. So these two angles here are equal because these are alternate angles and parallel lines. At the same time, the horizontal component becomes fs cosine theta. The reason why I've done this is similar to before, when we don't have friction, and that is we want to resolve the forces in the vertical plane and the horizontal plane. Let's start by looking at the horizontal plane. In the horizontal plane, we can see that there are two vectors. We have the horizontal component of the friction and the horizontal component of the normal force. So we can say that the centripetal force, which is the net force in the horizontal direction, this is equal to fs cosine theta plus fn sine theta. So the horizontal components of the two forces. And of course, this is equal to mv squared over r equals to fs cosine theta plus fn sine theta. On the side here, it's good to note that the static friction also equals to the static friction coefficient times by the normal force. We can substitute this by using the following expression. So we can say that the static friction is equal to the coefficient times by the normal force, cosine theta, plus fn sine theta, and this is all together equal to the centripetal force. Let's call this equation 1. In the vertical plane, we can do something similar. We've got three vectors in the vertical plane. We've got the vertical components of the normal force and the static friction, as well as a downward acting wave force. These three vertical components or vectors, they need to provide a net force of zero, because as we know, the vehicle should be staying on the surface and staying in contact with the bank surface at all times. So that means the magnitude of the upward normal vector so fn cosine theta, its magnitude must be equal to the two downward vertical vectors combined together. So this will be the vertical component of the static friction and the weight force combined together. Like I've done before, I can substitute the friction with the coefficient of friction times the normal force, sine theta plus mg. So now I've derived the two equations, one for the horizontal forces and one for the vertical forces. We can solve them simultaneously by dividing one by equation two. So on the left-hand side, we have mv squared over r from equation one divided by mg from equation two. On the right-hand side, we will have mu s fn cosine theta divided by
On the left hand side, we can cancel the term mass. And on the right hand side, every term has the normal force, so we can cancel Fn with all the terms. This will give us a simplified expression of V squared over Rg. This is equal to mu s cosine theta plus sine theta divided by cosine theta minus mu s sine theta. So this expression will give us the maximum velocity that the vehicle can travel at before it slips in the presence of friction. If you take a closer look at the expression, you can see that if the coefficient becomes zero, so that is if the friction is not present, the entire right-hand side fraction can simplify into just sine theta in the numerator and cosine theta in the denominator. When you have sine theta divided by cosine theta alone, this will simplify into tangent theta. So when we have tangent theta equals to v squared of rg, that is this expression that we derived in the previous video on a bank surface without any friction. Okay, let's take a look at the other scenario where the velocity is slower than the ideal velocity. When the vehicle slows down and when its velocity becomes the required velocity to maintain a circular motion, the static friction will act up the slope to reduce the centripetal force that's acting on the vehicle. And I've used the green vectors again to illustrate the direction of the static friction in terms of the vertical component and the horizontal component. So we're going to approach this in the same way. We're going to start with the horizontal plane and look at the normal forces acting on the vehicle. So in this case, the centripetal force is also the net force. And this is equal to the horizontal component of the normal force, Fn sine theta. And in this case, we will minus the horizontal component of the normal force. So that's Fs cosine theta. And this is because you can see the direction here is opposing the direction of the normal force. And this is in the opposite direction as where the centripetal force will act. That's why I'm subtracting Fs cosine theta. And I'll write down mv squared over r. And just like before, I am going to substitute and replace the Fs with coefficient times by the normal force. Let's call this equation one again. Uh, as for equation two, let's do the vertical component. In a vertical plane, again, all the vertical vectors should add up to a net force of zero. But this time, you can see the friction vertical component is acting upwards in the same direction as the vertical component of the normal force. So we can say that when these two combine together, plus fs sine theta, these magnitude will be equal to the downward acting weight force. And like before, I'll substitute the friction with the coefficient times of a normal force, and this gives us the weight force. Uh, let's call this equation two. Now I'm going to solve the two equations simultaneously by dividing the first equation by the second equation. This gives me mv squared over r divided by mg. And on the right hand side, I'll have fn sine theta minus coefficient times by cosine theta divided by fn cosine theta plus mu f uh, sine theta. And of course, the mass on the left hand side will cancel out, and the normal forces on the right hand side will cancel out as well. So we'll get v squared over rg equals to sine theta minus the coefficient times by cosine theta divided by cosine theta plus mu s sine theta. So this expression is for when the static friction is acting up the slope. And this is when the vehicle's velocity is slower than the ideal velocity. Again, like before, you can see that if the friction is not present, the mu zero, the coefficient is zero. So that on the right hand side, the entire fraction will simplify into just sine theta divided by cosine theta, which simplifies into tangent theta. So that will give us exactly the same expression as if there's no friction. And we'll derive this in another video on bank surfaces without any friction.